Welcome to Make Shit Happen. My guest today is Michael Ogg. Mike, thank you so much for making the drive and coming over here to Make Shit Happen Studios. And, you know, I'm honored that you're here. I met you about a couple of weeks ago with a good friend of ours, Eduardo, Eduardo Adame. I uh, interviewed uh, Eduardo uh, about a couple of months ago. And he wanted me to meet you and he wanted us to kind of hook up. And I really thought your personality, you know, we gelled so well. I invited you over here to my podcast and I am really honored and I really appreciate you accepting my invite and coming over. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for the invitation. Awesome. I told Eduardo, you must be really desperate for guests if you invited me. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Uh, I just, I, I, I thought... I thought we had great chemistry when we when we sat and talked. And I mean, you know, when you're interviewing somebody or you want to know somebody about somebody, you really got to have good chemistry. Right. And uh, and I thought we talked over there for a couple of hours. I'm like, you know, if I can talk to you a couple of hours, you know, I think the world needs to also hear, you know, what Mike Ogg is about. So so here Perfect. we are. Perfect. So so you and Eduardo are partners in we are. Uh, Rock Mortgage we Company are. in Houston. Yeah. And how long have y'all worked together? So I started the company in 2011. Uh, company is a is, is a generous. It was me and another loan officer and one processor, and um, had no intention to get bigger than that. And then in 2013, uh, one of our uh, account executives who calls on us, uh, a bank trying to get us to send them business, which, who I was good friends with, also was good friends with Eduardo. And he had just had left a bad experience with his uh, his prior partnership, and uh, was looking to hook up with someone and and uh, and grow the company. And of course, you met him. I mean, he has an infectious personality and uh, could sell ice to an Eskimo. <laughs> um, you know, so he was young and enthusiastic, and he brought something to the table that I didn't bring. And uh, we joined forces in uh, in uh, 2013. I sold him half the company, and you know, we're seven, almost eight years. Yeah, later. eight years, almost. Yeah, yeah that's we actually that. we actually went live as the new branded company two days before um, what was the event that we had? Uh, the COVID? No, 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 no. Uh, 2013 was the hur it was a hurricane. Oh, Ike yeah. or some, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, Ike, Ike, Ike. So yeah, we went. Uh, no, no, that's uh, a funny story, by the way. Um, if we have time for it. Later. 2013. I don't think we had. It was a we, we were. It, it was, was something. A, it was a flooding event, or, or again, uh, something. Some kind of major, some kind of major uh, natural disaster, and we had just been approved for our credit line, our Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac credit line, and we had, you know, we when uh, we we fund our own business, we close everything in our own name, but we're not servicers, so we always end up selling the servicing mm -hmm. um, before the customer even closes, so. The, you know, they sat on our credit line uh, until the company buys them back. Well, anytime the governor or the president de declares a national disaster, nothing is done. Every house has to be reinspected. Wow. So, and this was a major event. Um, and we had, I think, 15 or 20 loans that we had closed that were, uh, that had not been bought off of our credit line yet. And... I was a nervous wreck. I mean, I, I called it, I called our guy at the credit line, and I'm like, man, I mean, I don't even know we can pay the interest on this thing. And he's like, look, you guys are great guys, really hit it off with you. I'm not going to put you out of business. And they, I mean, literally, we didn't get anything bought off the off our credit line for almost 90 days, and they waived all the interest. They really took care of us. And but it was that our, a marriage started two days later. It was like, oh my god. <laughs> so, so that's when you and yeah. Eduardo came yeah, came so. together, and and I'm, I guess y'all have been really successful in doing so. We have. We are, uh, uh, you know, kind of. We have two different approaches to the way we do business, and it and it and it works. Um, I'm I'm always have been a relationship guy. Um, I like dealing with realtors and builders, and and uh, I've been very successful. In fact, we I'm, I, we've I can't think of maybe a handful of realtors that are what I consider professional realtors that I've lost in the last several years. And Eduardo has been a database guy. He, I mean, he's got a few realtors as well, but, you know, um, he, he likes working his, uh, his, his, you know, his, his circle and he's been, his list. 
Well, he's been very involved in, in a lot of network marketing events, uh, programming uh, events. Networking events, yeah. yeah. Network, I mean, he, he's belonged to several of those groups, started some. So, um, and what we didn't have was that internet presence, that social media presence. And as you, if, you've, if you're friends with Eduardo on Facebook or Instagram, um, everyone feels like they know him because he is, he's very good at, he's very good at, keeping his profile up and, 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 and promoting us and the company. Um, so we really started focusing our attention on building a brand. Yeah. And um, we, had done some, we had done some radio advertising on 610. I'm sure you've advertised on there as well. Um, and, you know, we really couldn't find our niche. And then we hooked up with uh, some pretty smart people who built us a, a really nice website um, we started buying some Google ads and momentum started happening. And, you know, that's where every company would like most of their business to come from. Um, you know, realtors are fickle. Um, some with, with some, not all, you're only as good as your last deal. Builders are the same way. You know, clients, um, a database of clients, um, if the economy is, if the economy is not great and the rates aren't low, there's not much we can do there. So you really got to, you know, you got to be in that top three to top five. Yeah, absolutely. When people start, start searching for mortgage companies. And um, I'm, I'm proud to say that thanks to some very smart guys that we hired, we're number one in, in most categories. That's, that's awesome. Mortgage broker, mortgage lender, um, uh, FHA loan. So we're, we're getting a lot of it organically now, and the brand is building. So I kind of want to know a little bit about you, too. I mean, that's great. I'm, I'm glad you have a business. But one thing before we move on to that, you said you're a relationship guy. A lot of people in business, they get in business, and they don't understand the relationship aspect, right? I'm, I'm very big on relationship myself. And, and I feel like, you know, we live in, we might be live, we live in a small world because somehow, somewhat, it just makes a full circle and you get you you get right there and that's what I always tell people who work for me people who are like you know uh, i mean who do business with me like hey don't don't forget it's a small world somehow you'll meet again right. you'll always meet and i always say you'll always meet that person a second time or a third time right. or a fourth time you might think you won't but you will so so just make sure you leave a good impression so when you meet them the second time they know who you are and relationship is very important to me because at the end of the day, we are still in people business. We are still human business. I mean, I uh, hope, you know, look like the way the world is going. One day, everything is going to get automated, right? Right. But, uh, but, but I still think for, we're, for right now, we're still in, in the age we live, we're still in people business. So we got to heavily depend on people. So me, myself, is, a, are, you know, also a very relationship guy. You want to explain your view on relationship? Like why you say you're a relationship guy? Um. It comes natural to me. I mean, even with uh, servers at restaurants, um, you know, I think I drive my wife crazy sometimes because I feel like everyone's my friend. But um, I think the key, um, you know, we're both in sales um, and we both sell something that they can get anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, the furniture is a commodity, mortgages are a commodity. Um, so what do you have to sell? We all sell in the same product. Okay. And for the most part, our rates uh, are as low as anyone else's rates. So you're selling you, you're selling yourself. Well, I mean, the first thing that I've tried to do with every realtor that refers me a deal the first time, or even a client is make a personal connection. And, and, um, and, it, and it's not because I'm trying to sell you something. It's, it's who I am at my core. And I just think that Looking up a name in the phone book is not nearly as not nearly as uh, uh, reassuring as, as as you saying, "Hey, this is my good friend Mike Og. He's been in the mortgage business forever. He's he's done multiple mortgages for me and my friends and family. Um, you know, either you're referring me as a as a consumer or a realtor as, hey, this guy closes loans. You know, I mean, we have a, such a good reputation. It sounds so silly, but just make, I mean, we, we close our loans on time. Um, I read a survey a few years ago that it's, it's under 70% of mortgages close on the original scheduled due date. Mm -hmm. We've been in the high nineties 
I've been in the high 90s. I mean, I've, I've been in the mortgage business since 2002. Um, everywhere I've ever been, um, you know, that's, it's the most important purchase of someone's life. Yeah. It's also that realtor's commission. And I hold that, I mean, that means something to me. Um, so, you know, in, 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 in the mortgage business, if you've ever gone through it, something may come up, it, it may get tumultuous, but, uh, but that relationship with that realtor, uh, and that, and that client will help you through those times. If you have no relationship and you call with bad news or you call and ask for something that's, that you may even think is ridiculous, but the underwriter has to have, yeah. you know, that relationship means something and, and they want to help you. Yeah. And I don't know. I just think that, I mean, I'm a small town guy. I mean, I, I grew up in a small town and everybody knows everybody. Um, and you have that mentality. Yeah. It's just, it's just who I am. And I'm, of course you can tell I'm not shy. I'm, I mean, I'm a salesman at heart. Uh, I just think that, you know, going through life and not building relationships, I don't, pe- I don't see how people live like that. So, you know, you say you're a small, small town guy. Tell us a little bit, like, you know, about your early life. Um, I'm an army brat. Uh, in fact, my, my dad was actually in the army a couple of years before Vietnam started. Um, so I think he ended up doing three tours. Um, so, um, my mom and I, and then, and then my brother, I've got one brother. Um, we stayed in Oklahoma in the little small town, little community that, that I grew up in or they grew up in, uh, until my, until Vietnam was over. Uh, and then my dad went to drill sergeant school. And then we were mainly in, mainly in two places, Fort Seal, Oklahoma. And then eight, he did eight years at, at, at uh, Fort Leonard Wood. And uh, he retired in 78 or 79. And we moved back to, uh, to Oklahoma uh, on a couple hundred acres. My dad um, had the last two years in the service had um, went to electrical school. He knew he was going to get out. He knew he wasn't going to do 20. Um, so he um, became an electrician. And uh, he started his own uh electrical company and we moved to the country which is he was he was raised in the country and uh horses and you know pastures and tractors and all that fun stuff and that's kind of um how i grew up until i got into high school um and then he had sold that place and we had actually moved in uh to a little community outside of uh tulsa called broken arrow okay i ended up graduating high school from broken arrow all right and then after high school uh you know you had like a little life shifting kind of oh, yeah, experience. Yeah. Well, I actually started my, I started working for Walmart when I was 16 years old, um, through a co-op program through the high school called, uh, DE or DECA. Um, and, uh, started, you know, as a stockman and, um, really fell in love with it. And, and back then, I think there may have been less than 500 Walmarts and they were rapidly growing. Um, I got excited about it. Um, worked there for two years, uh, graduated, uh, high school. And then they had just, they had started this program, um, where they would, um, pay for your school and I'm and you would sign a contract to come back and be a, an assistant manager or store manager. And, um, uh, I wanted in that. In fact, I had signed up for that program and I don't know what, uh, what it was, but the district manager, the guy that ran all the, all the stores in, in Oklahoma saw something in me and decided that he would, he didn't want to wait for me to, uh, to get out of school. So he promoted me. And at the time I was the youngest assistant manager in Walmart history at 19 years old. Um, but I had, you know, as I was telling you earlier uh, before the show, you know, I had been going, taking classes since I was a junior in, in high school. So technically I had completed almost two years, just, I think right at two years. Um, and I always tell myself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back. I'm going to go back. Uh, maybe in a few years when I retire, I'll go back and just to, just to say I did it. But, um, yeah, I worked for, I worked for Walmart, uh, until 88, and uh, I just couldn't do retail. Um, I had uh, 
when you start at uh, at Walmart as a back then as a as a young single assistant manager, um, their their growth they had so much growth that you know you every twice a year you had to go for eight weeks on the road and set up a new store somewhere, uh, which is how I met my first wife. Uh, she was actually one of the employees that I had hired. Again, I'm I think I don't even think I've turned twenty yet. I'm still nineteen. She's eighteen. She hadn't even graduated high school yet. And I'm probably 150 mi- 110 miles away from my home store and uh, ended up falling in love, which is a big no-no. Uh, thank God we didn't work together every day. Um, but we, uh, after the store setup was over, I went back home and ended up uh, uh, just couldn't live without her. And I moved her to my town. She hadn't even graduated high school yet. She had to transfer her senior year in high school. Uh, she ended up graduating from a from a town that she went to school at for a couple months. But uh, anyway, so, you know, back then it was 80 hours a week. In fact, during inventory and Christmas time, it was 110 hours a week. Um, and I did that a couple times, and uh, they transferred me to three different stores. And then uh, I, 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 w- I had already felt like this is not for me. Um, a couple of buddies of mine who were managers had gone and started – working at uh, different types of companies. And uh, they had told me on a Friday that I needed to be in Kentucky within 10 days. My wife's pregnant. It just, I'm, I just said, no, I'm done. And uh, I called a buddy of mine who had went to work for, I think, the first subprime automobile lending uh, company in the nation. And uh, I called him. He said, you want to be a collector? I'm like, I, I don't know. Uh, back then, if, you're, if you lend money, they made you start out in collections. They figured if you're going to loan it, you, you, know, you, you better learn how to, how to collect it. Um, and uh, I did that for about three or four months, and they put me on the underwriting desk uh, as a junior underwriter, approving car loans that were being faxed in on thermal paper from, I think we were in 13 states. Um, I... Worked, uh, worked there for a couple of years, ended up getting promoted to assistant credit manager. My territory that I called on, all the dealers that I, the, the finance guys that I called on were in Houston. And uh, uh, a couple of guys decided to start uh, a, a company in, uh, in Houston called First Investors Financial Services. Um, and they started asking all the dealers, hey, who's, who's a good underwriter? Who do you guys like doing business with? Mm-hmm. And five or six of the guys mentioned my name. And the next thing I know, I get recruited to come to Houston, Texas before they even have an office open. So uh, I was the first employee hired. Um, worked there for 10 years. Um, I'm, only a 10 years uh, I'm only 10 years younger than my boss. He's not going anywhere. Um, it, it became, we went public. Uh, and what company is this? Uh, First Investors Financial Service. First Investor, okay. Right. They're still in business. They're, they're still in they're, business. They're, they're all, yeah, they're doing yeah. well. I think they've gone private. I think they ended up buying back all the stock. But we, we I would, uh, interesting, we went public um, a couple months before 9-11. In fact, my, uh, uh, the CEO and I had just flown. We were in that tower five months before, uh, before the planes hit. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it was a uh, definitely interesting time, but uh, about seven or eight months later, I had already been talking to uh, one of my one of, one of the guys one of the F, one of the finance managers who had gotten the mortgage business and was telling me how wonderful it was and how good I would be at it. And I'm like, I don't know. At the time, I was making 120 grand a year, had a company car, uh, so I decided to quit that great corporate job. And this is this is what year. Uh, 2002, 2000, actually, yeah, two, it was, uh, the end of 2001, about three, three or four months after nine 11, 120,000 of good money at that time. Oh, at that, you know, got a company car and everything. It's probably like making two, you know, 200 now, 250, close to 240, 250. Yeah. But, uh, my uh, ex-wife and I had just built, uh, uh, just built, a a, a big house. Actually, no, I'm picking it. I'll take it back. I, I'm, I'm. Um, I had gotten divorced prior to leaving First Investors a few years before, um, which 
probably led to my divorce. Um, was working lots of hours for a for a, a, a single guy who didn't have anything going on in his life and expected his people to be there when he was there. Um, so anyway, um, my buddy had started a little mortgage company in Clear Lake, and I lived in Cyprus. So um, my wife thought I'd lost my mind. I lost my mind. My my current wife. She, so she so here, I, let's let's take it back a little yeah. bit. So you moved over here with your wife. And you divorced her. I mean, you and her went through a divorce. We, we did. We, we, we divorced. Um, 94? 94? 93, 94. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then you, you, you got was, married to a, the what, current wife right now. 97. I was single for almost just a little, just a little over three, three and a half years. Do you, and one of the reasons you, you said earlier that was that you went through a divorce because you were working too much? I mean, working, um, and when I wasn't working, I was doing something I wanted to do. Yeah. You know? Just being young, Vegas, just being young and dumb and selfish. Yeah. Had two young kids at home, um, and, you know, you just get you get lost, and, you know, you're, you're so stressed out at work. You know, when you get home, you don't want to deal with that. You want to go play golf, or you want to go to Vegas, uh, Or do something that you enjoy. Right. And so, you, you know, does, do you think that happens to a lot of people who, are, oh, who yeah. become successful or who are, you know? I think so. I mean, it, it, I mean, the corporate world is great. I, I'm so happy that there's people who, who like that. But um, I don't know how it is now. I can't speak to how it is now. But back then, it was, I mean, it was a lot of pressure, um, especially when you're growing like we were growing Uh, we started out just in Texas, and by the time I left, I think we were in 40-something states. Mm -hmm. um, and for the first few years, uh, we had a sales manager, but I would, we would fly, and we'd be, on, we'd be on the road opening up new markets, signing, you know, signing up all the dealers in a new market. Uh, so it's kind of like the old Walmart days. You're spent you know, three or four weeks, sometimes a month, on the road. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, she just, uh, she just wanted someone to be home and you know, to be a, a good husband and you know, uh, taught me a lot, taught you a lot, taught me a whole lot. Well, do you mind sharing what, no, it, what I mean, a couple of just, things you learned? I mean, losing data, I mean, losing, uh, daily contact with your kids. Um, although, um, there's no doubt in my mind, I was a much better father after than I was before. I mean, uh, I mean, w uh, my ex-wife and I had, had agreed on a true joint custody mm -hmm. and the judge said no back then. I think it's very commonplace now, but he saw, you know, go, kids going back and forth. It's, it's a, it's a nightmare. There needs to be a conservator. So, um, of course, you know, and not, and not that I would ever take my children away from their wonderful mother. It was, it was, they were better off with her for sure. But I had to go, you know, set up a household and make, make sure they had bedrooms and, But, you know, Wednesday night and every other weekend. But I will say that uh, my ex-wife, I mean, we, I don't think we've had an argument since. Mm -hmm. We've agreed on everything. Uh, made it so much easier on the kids. And we didn't stick to that divorce decree. You know, it said, you know, every other Christmas. And, I mean, in the summertime, I got them whenever I wanted them. Uh, so we still have a great relationship. It's a... It's, uh, You know, thank God for it. Uh, I, I got friends that, you know, that they, they can't. They can't one thing stand, you said, one thing you said. The same room. Yeah, one thing you said that you were your better father after. Oh, yeah. Than, than oh, during yeah. your marriage. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there was, I mean, I, again, I have a bad memory because of my age, but it's, uh, I can't remember not getting my kids every Wednesday and at, at the minimum every other weekend. And I did not miss anything that they did, which is another reason. And you can't you can't work in that corporate environment and be at all your kids, um, you know, cheerleading events and volleyball events and school plays, and you can't do it. Um, so um, I was I, I really got in tune with my kids. So is that and then in 2002 when you left the corporate world, what I mean, you know, what did you what did you decide? Um, I mean, really. Uh, the mortgage business rates had just dropped. Uh, and 
I just figured, you know what? I, I, I could never imagine in a million years being on straight commission. But, uh, but now let me ask you a but, question. You, you got into okay. a mortgage comp business in 2001, 2000, yeah. at the end of 2001. Now this is the age that we are getting into where the variable rates are, you know, are the thing, you know, which eventually oh, yes. leads to the demise of. Well, they weren't as popular when I started as they were, you know, surviving that mortgage meltdown, watching these companies devour the, the devour themselves was crazy. But yeah, when I started, um, I think, I think most, I think my mortgage was around six, six and a half percent and rates were in the fours. And, um, uh, the guy that, the guy that I went to work with, Kurt Smith, brilliant guy. Um, he, you know, he, he recruited me, um, and he was doing, he, I think he was dropping 10,000 postcards, uh, per week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can buy the data from the credit bureau. Right. And where you can actually, you can actually say, I only want to mail to people that I know I can save 1%. You know, if you have the original, if you have the original balance, the current balance and the payment, you can back into what the rate is. So we were, we were dropping 10,000 pieces a week. And the phone was, it was like working in a boiler room. Really? Um, so now, so now, yeah. now, you know, you got in this, you got in the mortgage industry and I want to talk about that a little bit, if you don't mind, you know, that's when, that's when the interest rates are high. I mean, you know, I'm talking about people, I mean, today can't even fathom the thought of paying oh, 7%. They're, they mean, it, interest rate, right? They can't, they can't fathom paying 4%. Right. When you tell a, when you tell a first time buyer that their rate is 4%, and it, I mean, 2018, nine, early 19, I mean, rates were going heading to five. Right. Before, for no reason, I mean, no logical reason. Well, um, in 18, in 18, they, they, yeah. they ended up hitting five. Right. Okay. But there was no logical reason for them to come back down, but they did. Right. So, so I mean, you know, and, and matter of fact, I did, I did a big mortgage on one of my commercial buildings. And I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of in a swap in you know in commercial lending there's more, they do swaps and i'm like i'm like regret the decision i made every day about that and it's at five percent and you can't un undo a swap and it's at 5.1 percent i mean and today you can close something at three at 3.5 i mean i'm talking about just in three years commercially yeah commercially right you can you can close you can close something today at 3.5 matter of fact i'm doing you know right. i'm doing a refi at 3.5 at 3.6 today uh we close next week but it's, it's it's crazy how the rates have gone down. But in residentially mortgage, what you do, your bread and butter, I mean, people were buying houses in 2001, 2000 at 7%, 6.9%, 6.5%. Yeah. 5% 6 was a great rate. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, there was an arm, the adjustable rate mortgage, well, which eventually ended up leading into a destruction of mm, mortgage yeah, the, business. The arms got, I mean, rates. So the, re, the little refi boom of the early 2000s lasted about two years. Um, um, rates got down into the, to the below 5%. So we were, we were refinancing people at seven and then we started seeing, and when I first started, the only way you, if you wanted to put less than 10% down, it was FHA with three and a half percent. Yeah. But, um, you know, then they went, came out with 5% down and then it was 3% down. Well, then. Uh, I mean, and the, the economy was, was doing well, how the housing market was doing well all over the country. And, um, it, it just, the insanity started, I guess, end of 2003 was the first time a, 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 a subprime company walked into my door. Um, I'm trying to think of who they were, um, offering an 80, 20. So in the, in the mortgage business, you know, it's either 20 stand, the, the, 90% of the loans are 20% down, 5, uh, 10, 5, or 3. Um, and that's only, well, the three's only happened recently. But they were offering um, two loans, the first at 80%, the second at 20%. The first was probably, it was, they were both, they were both arms. So the first might be at four and a quarter um, with a, with a, with a two-year adjustment with a maximum of adjustment of, of sometimes nine or 10. Um, and the, the second lien was like six and a half that could go to 13 or 14. Um, and you know, the credit, the, I think you had to have a six sixty credit score. And then every month that went by, someone else came in 
Well, the credit score only has to be 630. And so let me, the, under, let me understand that. They'll finance the whole 100% of the 100% house? 100% of a house. Okay, so hold on. So they will, there will be two mortgages on the house. The first one is? One day is at 80%. And the other one was 20%. Correct. So they are financing. So that's really what happened. They were financing 100% of the house. So the buyer can walk in. With, with I with, mean, and if, if the seller was willing to pay the closing cost, which they usually rolled into the deal, with zero skin in the game, not not, not a penny out of pocket. Really? And so now let me, let, me, let me ask you a question. And, and you know, we all saw 2008. And, and you, you know, we all know that it was all, and, and I'm sorry, because I know you're in the profession. We are like, hey, you know, it's all the mortgage brokers who screwed up the economy and the, and the subprime companies who screwed up the economy. And they basically put these people in the houses. And I mean, you know, I've heard that a hundred times. People have heard that a thousand times. Nobody kind of understood it until I think you were basically telling us we can just walk in the house with nothing down. But today it's happening still still it, it it's going that way well it, it just just so just for clarification's sake um you know the the 100 percent loans started 2003 but they still required a decent credit score verified income verified assets toward the end the last 12 months there was all kinds of companies come and go but i'm talking about wells fargo bank of america and wachovia they were every, I mean, they were beating my door down every single day with 100% financing down to a 580 credit score with stated income, stated assets. Now, the stated income, stated asset program was started 10 years earlier for self-employed people who made a lot more money than what they put on their taxes. They had a very smart accountant. That's what it was designed for. But we would look at, we would look at cash flow and see that they could afford the payment. Toward the end, you had Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and Wachovia giving us, telling us to go to salary.com and use the national average. Well, the national average for a school teacher back then was like $68,000. But in Houston, it's, back then it was $40,000. So we, we were putting people, you didn't have to cheat. You know, if, if you've ever watched the, the movie, uh, The Big Short, you know, they made us look like idiots. Now, look, there were some cheaters for sure. There were some appraisers in cahoots with mortgage people um, that went on. But 90, I would say 95% of what went wrong, that's not what happened. What went wrong is they thought, the, they thought the housing market would always go up. So even if they got the house back, they couldn't lose. Well, and, and greed took over. I mean, they were selling these, they were selling these securities. I mean, and we all know about the credit swaps and the guarantees and all that. I mean... They were, it was like a, I came from the automobile subprime underwriting where you're, where you have collateral, but it's mobile. I mean, I, I was underwriting. I mean, we had to verify, verify three or four references, make sure the address is real, make sure the income was real. I mean, we, we caught people trying to fake pay stubs all the time. I mean, we got, we're, I mean, there, there's professional counterfeiters out there, but we got good at it. So I have an underwriter's heart. I'm sitting here looking at this thinking maybe they know something that I don't know. And, and, and maybe then maybe they're not worried about the loss because the housing market will continue to go up. So, but I mean, it's an, it sounds insane. We didn't cheat, didn't have to cheat. All you had to do was give Wells Fargo bank of America capital one. I mean, you name the big banks, they were all doing it, what they were asking for. Give Just go to salary.com and find the average and put it in. They would tell so us, stated do not income. In, yeah, do not write the income on the application. Don't write it in. Leave it blank. Really? So so let me let me ask you a question. Stated income, for, for people who are hearing it, stated income is someone who just, if I'm the client, I just state my income is $100,000. Yeah. I don't have to, I, 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 you don't have to verify it. Well, so stated, that's more for self-employed. Um, they call it stated income. But they, but again, they were, it, if I'm a school would teacher, never, will I have to give my W-2 to you? No, no documentation. No docs needed. No assets required, no income required. I went, all we had to do is verify they had the job. That's it. Make sure that they really had the job. That was all we had to do. And 
go to and and go to salary.com and make sure whatever they put didn't exceed the national average. Got you. So so as long as it did not exceed the national average, you're good to go. I mean, the national average for a police officer is like 89, 90,000. There's no there's no police off unless they're working tons of overtime. Overtime. They're not making that as a regular salary. But it again, I mean, we there was no cheating involved. You were given, you know, the smartest banks in the nation what they give you the guidelines. For. They give you right. the guidelines. And so, then, and then they, they all get bailed out and then we're made to be the bad guys. So now let me I mean, you know, there's a lot of people who when this mortgage meltdown happened, okay? And we just hear all the things. I don't know anybody personally, but a lot of people went to jail, a lot of people went to prison, a lot of people, you know, but you just said there was people in cahoots with their appraisal and stuff. Oh, yeah. What was going on over there? I mean, they had, you know, straw purchase was probably the main thing. So a straw purchase is... is what where, is a straw purchase? So it happens in the car. I learned it in the car business. Um, it's where, you know, your brother who doesn't have good credit, maybe can't verify his income, can't qualify for a car. So Sam goes in and tells the Chevrolet dealership, it's for you. You fill out a credit application. Um, you get the loan in your name. You get the title in your name. And then you hand the keys to your brother. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're smart, 90% of people aren't, they, they make sure the payment gets made because brother already has bad credit. Yeah. So they're, they're trusting a guy who doesn't have a good history to make the payment. So when I go looking for the car, Sam doesn't have it. Well, they were doing the same thing in the, in the mortgage, in, in the mortgage industry. They would, they would, they were advertising. There were companies advertising that they would pay you 5,000 or $10,000 to let you use, to let, you, let, let them use your credit to purchase a property. They had this big elaborate contract that would make people sign and they would, they would write them a check for 5,000. I think, oh, if the house was between 200 and 250, it was $10,000. And then they would sell it. <clears throat> uh, they would sell it to their friend and they would get, they would get a, uh, a dirty appraiser to write an appraisal for 40 or $50,000 over. And then they would write, they would uh, sell it for that appraised value. That guy would pocket the cash. And then this guy, he would either would move in or he'd put a renter in there. And they would, and, and what, when it ended up happening is, you know, they would, they would make, you know, eight or nine, 10 payments. And then he would stop sending the payments in and the houses were just sitting everywhere. I mean, wow. it was, it was wow. Now, I mean, what I mean, a disaster. And I mean, the FBI opened an office in Houston because Houston was the central hub for this program. This, this whole, I mean, there's so many ways back then that you could be dirty. Um, and I mean, you didn't have to cheat. You didn't have to lie to get a customer approved, but, since anyone who fogged a mirror could qualify, I mean, all these, all these investors or, or, or grifters basically, you know, got people who ordinarily wouldn't qualify for a mortgage anyway. Well, now they've got bad credit and they're getting a hundred percent loan for 10 grand and have no intention of ever occupying the property. Wow. That now, is, I can tell you with, with, with the, with, confidence that's not happening today yeah. now have we started seeing a loosening look i've been doing this i've been in the mortgage business now this is 20 years it is they can't tighten up fast enough and they can't loosen up fast enough they can't tighten up fast enough because what happens you know the government on the bottom of each application it has the, you know everyone wants to know why they want to know what my race is why do they want to know um you know what 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 uh, male or female, the, all the data they collect on you. I mean, they're not using it for, all they're using it for, would, when you see those numbers come out that says, you know, um, African-American housing is down 12%, that's where they're getting it. So, um, and, you, you know, every four years you get a new HUD commissioner who sits and looks at like, man, you know, we're not making enough loans in the black communities. We might, we're not making enough loans in the Hispanic community they must be redlining again. You know, redlining used to be what banks would do. They'd go, these zip codes, we're not loaning in these zip codes. They would draw a red line through them. So, you know, and when they start looking, why? It's, it's, it's not discriminatory. It's, it's, it's based on data. It's based on income. It's based on credit. It's based on all those things. Now, we can have another conversation about why that happens. But, you know, politicians are politicians. So they decide... Hey, we need to we need to change the guidelines up. We need to do 
a 3% down program. Um, we need to do low to mod. They have, they have that low to moderate income program. If you live in a low to moderate income zip code, um, you qualify for 100% financing. Now, and they do underwrite these deals, and they make, they make sure these people are real. They make them sign something that says they have to keep the house for at least seven years. There's all kinds of guidelines, and they're, and they're, and they're really underwriting these loans. And I'm, please don't think that I'm saying these people don't, aren't deserving. I, I don't know. We don't do those. Um, there's, it, it's, a, it's a whole lot of red tape and not a whole lot of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it takes away from my, my primary business. But thank God there's people who do those loans. Um, but, you know, that's happening. But to the best of my knowledge, they're not, it, it, it's, not a, it's, not the run, it's not the runaway freight train. Like it used to be. And, and, they, and they're, making the, the, they're making the bar. We're taking bar as an education course. Um, and I, I, I hope those loans perform. I hope that, I mean, there's a lot of people, if given the opportunity, I'm sure a lot of those people who got 100% loans did great. You know, I mean, I think it was a 25 or 30% default rate. That means that 70% of the people paid. Paid. Yeah. Hopefully they refied by now. If you haven't, call Rock Mortgage. Yeah, <laughs> call Rock Mortgage. Hey, so let me let me ask you uh, this, Mike. Um, you said loosening is happening right now, but right now we are going through this like unprecedented time where there's no inventory of these houses coming. <sighs> people are sitting on their houses tight. It's right. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, it's, what do you it, think about that? This I've never seen. I mean, 2013. Um, you know, that's the only year that I can really say that was, I mean, my wife and I sold our house and, and ended up getting almost $40,000 more than we had listed it for and more than it had appraised for. Um, and it was certain neighborhoods. Um, but 2019, I mean, we were, <clears throat> we were, you know, steadily growing. And then when, when the whole COVID thing happened, um, and, the tighter it got, the, the, the tighter the restrictions got everywhere else. Um, so if you're not aware of this, folks, there's a mass exodus of people moving uh, from California, from Washington State, from Boston, New York City. I mean, we're, Texas is, I haven't seen the numbers yet. At one time, I think 3,500 people a month, and that was like 18 months ago. Yeah. Um, and... So I was having a conversation with the realtor uh, in Austin a few months ago, and he sent me an article about Texas, about Texas inventory. So I think the article said they had been keeping records since the late 30s, the, the Texas Realtors Association and then the Houston Realtors Association. Um, Houston right now has a 31-day supply of houses. Um, now, that that's not the average days on the market. The average days on the market is probably six or seven. Um, it's the, and the, the uh, I don't remember exactly how that number is calculated, but it's, um, I mean, we've always had a 90 day, 120 day. There, this is the lowest it's ever been by a lot. And we're in fourth place. Um, Dallas Fort Worth was at 28%. Um, I think San Antonio was, I mean, uh, uh, 28 days. San Antonio was at 18. Austin was at 11 days. Wow. I mean, um, you know, we're trying to grow. We, we, I, I interviewed a, an office, uh, a branch manager and three loan officers in Austin who actually graduated college with one of my guys. And um, I, I mean, we, we've been wanting to open an office there forever. And the guy was like, Mike. If we made money on approvals, we would be, you know, we would be doing great. But we're having approval letters expire. Approval letters are good for 60 days. And as long as the job doesn't change, the credit report's good for 90 days. So really, you got 90 days. They're expiring. And people have, I mean, people were, I mean, he's had clients make 15, 20 offers. And, you know, cash is king. A lot of the people coming from the West Coast are paying cash. Um, And those that aren't paying cash, you know, even in Austin where I'm sure, you know, we, we consider Austin one of the more expensive places to live compared to California, Los Angeles per square foot, it's less than half. Yeah. So they're putting half down. Well, th- the people that aren't buying houses in Austin or anyone putting down less than 20%, you got to at least put down 20% to have a chance. Mm-hmm. But um, Austin is full. You've got builders writing, writing contracts 
for three and four years out with, with no numbers, they're doing cost plus. And you've had, I've heard of some, I've heard of a couple track home builders that are building for $210 a square foot, which a few years ago, that was a custom home. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's definitely impacted us. Um, we have a lot more approvals like everyone else does than they have houses. And we've had some clients, um, give up, um, you know, we'll, we'll put them on a, you know, usually they'll end up signing a lease six months. We, we try to suggest six months, you know, who, who knows what's going to happen. And for the first, Edward, and I have talked about this many times for the first nine to 12 months, I thought there's no way this is going to continue. Yeah. But it, the crazier it gets everywhere else. I mean, the not to get political, but other states that are far more restrictive than us are driving their citizenry to Texas and Florida and even Oklahoma, where I'm from. Um, you know, I talked to my cousin who's a REMAX agent, and she's like, you know, of course, they also legalized marijuana in Oklahoma. So yeah. she called it the, between the green rush and the, and the West Coasters. I mean, even people being able to work from anywhere now. You can live anywhere you want. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Oklahoma. One thing. One thing that's going to, uh, driving the rush to Oklahoma is is that thing. I mean, you know, and I think I think Oklahoma is pretty soon. You'll see a you know a big rise in their economy. I mean, because oh. I mean, you know, yeah, Colorado is the only state with a surplus for a reason. Yeah. I mean, it's now right now it's medical only, but you know, there's of little, course there, it's coming. Doctor shops everywhere where you can walk in and tell them that you have stress and they'll write you a prescription. Yeah, but I mean, they I I, I think I think Oklahoma is. I mean, you know, Oklahoma haven't had nothing going on for a long time. Well, I, think I mean, they've had, you know, casino. So I don't know if this is still true, but it used to be Oklahoma had more churches per capita than any other state in the union. I thought it was, you couldn't get any redder than Oklahoma, but they've had casino gambling now for more than 10 years. And now they've, they've, they've legalized marijuana. And of course, Texas, you know, Anytime you anytime you drive to a casino in Louisiana or or in Oklahoma, all the tags are from Texas. I think Texas is one of two states in the union that doesn't have yeah. uh, casino gambling. Thank uh, God. <laughs> I'm, I might be there more than I should, but yeah, we, we, we don't want to get political on that. But I mean, I think I think I think one of the reasons why we don't have any casinos is probably because uh, maybe because of Vegas, and and I think at one time I I I did like a little math. There was 36 flights that were going from Houston to <laughs> Vegas every day. Now, this is pre-COVID. I don't know what the number is now. 36 flights were going from Houston to Vegas, and most of them were full. Okay. So there's there's a reason. I mean, you know, um, I don't I don't think I don't think Vegas wants uh casinos in, in Texas. Well, there must be some good lobbying. And I'm but, I'm not talking about Dallas, remember. I'm only talking about Houston. Right. Well I'm not remember. talking about San Antonio or Austin. Austin right. have flights going to Vegas. Houston okay. have uh, San Antonio got flights going to Vegas. Oh yeah. Houston twenty eight Dallas flights. something you know something going on over there. But uh Mike, I wanna be considerate of, of your time and I know I know you're talking about a lot of stuff. I wanna know what is what is your next goal? What is your next move uh, as a as a person personally, and and uh, as a, as a business in business, what is, what do you think it will be? So, um, our primary goal, um, and and as as Eduardo talked about it before, is you know now that we've um, we, we've kind of branded ourselves pretty well in 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 Houston. I mean, we want an office in Austin and and San Antonio and in Dallas Fort Worth and maybe maybe more than one uh, we'd like to grow the company the smart way um, you know and we're, I mean we're ready to go right now I mean had COVID not happened we'd be doing that uh, but without inventory it's it's difficult to justify the expense yeah um, you know and and I don't see that this is going to change anytime soon I think that if you live in if you own property in Texas right now you should uh be thinking your lucky stars, especially if you if you're ready to sell. Um, but we want to grow the business. I mean, Eduardo wants to build an empire. He wants to, you know, he wants someone to write us a billion dollar check one day. Um, I'm, you know, 55 years old. Um, I've slowed down some. I've got, uh, you know, I've got some some good people working for me. My wife and I bought a ranch a, a couple years ago. Um, 
I spend most as I normally leave on Friday mornings unless unless something's going on. Uh, I'd like to work four or five more years. I have my uh, my son-in-law is uh, is my right hand man who is uh, uh, kind of taking care of most of the day to day stuff for my clients. Uh, I'm still involved. I still talk to them. Um, he gets to do all the fun stuff and all the registering and taking the applications. I get the the fun part for me is just talking to the client and. And, 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 you know, negotiate the rate, whatever I got to do. But, um, you know, I, I'd like to I always told myself I would retire at 50, Sam. <laughs> I mean, I mean that, that was my goal. And of course, you know, three daughters, uh, three colleges, three weddings. My youngest daughter just got married, uh, in July. So I told my wife, I said, we finally got our kids paid off, you know? So anything you do from this point forward is voluntary. So 50 to six, 50 went to 60. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm never, I'm a, I can't imagine not doing anything. Uh, um, when we bought our ranch, the, the, the gentleman who sold us our ranch, uh, really, really great realtor, 40 years old, you know, he, he, he puts his mule on a trailer of his four-wheel drive truck, and he, he drives around, you know, the county all day long look at, showing property. So I, I thought, what a great job to have. You know, I've got a trailer, I've got a ranger. Uh, I, I've been telling him for the last couple of years, I said, when I retire, I'm going to come down there and just sell property for you part time. <laughs> so especially with property. Pro I mean, I mean, the average price up there now is for if you're wanting 75 acres with a house, you're paying almost a million bucks. So yeah. That'd be a nice commission. It would be a nice commission. Absolutely. Uh, Michael, let's just say if today was the last day, uh, you know, for, for you, you, you end up living 100 years old. And, and, you know, today is the last day, uh, you know, and, and, and they come and they say, hey, t Mike, you're 100 years old, lived a good life, sold a lot of ranches after your mortgage business. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you did, you, you, you wrote some memoirs and did some podcasts and, you know, hey, you, everything is great, but now it's time to go meet your creator. And ev everything that you have done is going with you. Here goes a pen and a paper, write three things, you know, Now these can be three truces, that, that three keys to remember about that you me. that you want people to remember about you, your future generation, the future world, the future people who come after you, and these are three things. Right, pen and a paper. Write three things, three keys to greatness, three way to live mm. life. Whatever you think might be, what will those three be? Um, I, again, I mean, if you're asking the three things that I'd want people to remember about me, that's different than what I'd want to pass on but uh, let's talk um, about pass on so you know uh there's no there, there's no such thing as a shortcut number one you know? there's no there's such th thing I as mean, a shortcut there, there's not all right and, expand and, on it a little bit i mean i have some really good young people working for me they, they hate it when i use the m word the millennial word but um you know our children this 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 generation um most of them a lot of them you know they don't want to they don't want a job they want a career that you know they want a position and you know education is great but that's not going to get you you know that that gets you that gets you in the door but it's it's hard work and and dedication and 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 miss time with your family um and you know and not everyone is driven you know, people there's thank thank god there's people that are satisfied doing whatever they do. Um, but it, but if, if you want to be a successful person, there's no shortcuts for sure. And, and the second thing is learn from other people's mistakes. I know the best, the best lessons in life, you know, you, you have to learn your, your, your yourself, but there have been people, mentors of mine that have given me advice that I wish I had taken. I took some of it, Um, but you know, if, 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 it, if there's a person that you trust and they're your mentor, then, you know, don't make the same mistake as, as the guy that you're, that you're looking up to. All right. And number three, um, make time for your family. You got to, and I mean, it, it's, it's, it's been the biggest failure and the, big, the, the big, biggest success. You know, it's, you know, I, I was really bad at it. I feel like I'm better at it. Still not. Still not where I need to be, you know. Now I have got uh, six grandchildren, uh, three daughters. Um, you know, 
14 employees. Everyone, everyone wants a piece of your time. You know, you only can be in so many places at one time. But, um, you know, I think if this pandemic has, have shown, has, has shown us anything, you know, it's not the behemoth that they thought it was, but still life is short. I mean, there's, there's, you don't know how many days you have left. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not the person who dies with the most money in the bank that wins. So. Absolutely. You know, Mike, thank you so much for coming. I had, I had a great time interviewing you. I had a great time listening, you know, some of the stuff and learning. And I hopefully people enjoy that too. Hopefully I can bring you over here uh, next time, you know, pretty soon over here and talk a little bit more. You know, we can talk for a long time. I would love to. And, 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 and we've, um, we've asked Sam to be our first guest. Uh, Eduardo and I are, are, are going to do a podcast. Um, we don't want it to be about mortgage, mortgage, mortgage. That would be boring, snooze fest. But I have a lot of knowledge in consumer finance. Um, I've, I've, I, we can talk about this next time, but, you know, I owned a credit restoration company for 12 years. Uh, my brother still owns it. Um, so I know a lot about helping people get reestablished. It's not the end of the world. And uh -huh. we all make mistakes. We all have student loan debt. We all have credit cards go bad. You can still achieve the dream of owning a home, you know? I mean, pay cash for your cars, you know, have a debit card and own a home. Own a home. That's, you know? that's, that's, amen to that. Uh, Mike, where can people find you? Uh, are you on any social media? I am on Facebook. Uh -huh. um, Rock Mortgage is on Facebook. Uh, Rock MTG, MichaelThomasGeorge.com. Or you can dial the office at 832-230-3067. Okay, and you are on Facebook. Are you on I LinkedIn am, too, or no? I am on LinkedIn. I, I, I so they can find you Facebook or LinkedIn as right. what? Uh, what is your handle over there? Um, at LinkedIn, I will honestly have it. Is it Michael yeah, Og? Yeah, it's it's Michael Og. Michael D Og. Michael D Og, and right. and on Facebook. Facebook, it's Michael D. Og as well. Okay, so Michael D. Og, or they can call you. They can do Rock Mortgage, R Rock M T G, uh, dot com. Yep. Or they can call you again. The phone number again is 832-230-3067. Thank you so much, Michael. I Thank appreciate you, it. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it, buddy. All right. <laughs>